It is Tuesday evening and it's just turned six o'clock here in Sydney. My name is Benjamin Chong. I'm one of the co-directors of the Founder Institute here in Australia and New Zealand and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this much anticipated event, how to get your first 100 customers in Australia and New Zealand and we have a wonderful man and friend, William Wang, who will be telling us all about this with a proven system that he has taken to market with a number of businesses in the region. So we'll hear from William in a second. I'm so excited to be with you today and I wanted to share the agenda. So as you can see, over the next few minutes, I'll be explaining what we'll be doing then we'll turn over to wonderful William, who will give us a presentation that runs, I've been told, for about half an hour, and he'll have the opportunity to take your questions after this presentation. And then at seven o'clock, the real fun begins with some virtual networking. How does that sound? I want some thumbs up. I want to see some emojis. That'll be wonderful. By the way, we are, we are recording this session and we are very much looking forward to giving you some very practical tips, very practical hints on how you can grow your business. So before we do so, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Founder Institute. Because I've spoken with a couple of people today and I've fielded a number of inquiries, the Founder Institute is the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. We're in almost... 200 cities, we have a network of over 15,000 mentors, over 4,000 alumni, and in the last 10 plus years, we're really fortunate to have created some $20 billion worth of value. Now, established in 2009, we believe entrepreneurs can create real impact on society, but most startups fail because they lack expert feedback. They lack the proper focus during the early or the pre-seed stages of their business. So what we do at the Founder Institute is we help pre-seed founders and teams to get to traction and funding through a devoted support network and a structured growth process. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Now, aren't we at a funny time in the world's history? The reason we have this picture here is because did you know some 10 years ago when we were in the midst of the global financial crisis or the Great Recession, as it was called elsewhere, these companies were established. Some names that you might be very familiar with, Airbnb, DuckDuckGo, I use that as my search engine, New Relic, Postmates, Twilio, Warby Parker. So even in the midst of supposed tragedy, even in the midst of despair, great companies have been founded. And at the Institute, we'd suggest this is the time to build our post-COVID future. Founder Institute is here to help. We are running programs that are online and that are meant to help founders build meaningful and enduring technology companies. We're a pre-seed accelerator, so perhaps you might have gone to a startup weekend, you might have heard of Lean Startup Machine, but you're a little bit before a full-time residential acceleration program. That's where we come in. We, at this pre-seed, help at either the idea stage, we help if you've got a team or an MVP, or we help with growth. Over four months, we'll assist you to launch your business, and if you already launched your business, will help you to put it on the fast growth track. At the Founder Institute, we run a four-month part-time program to help you get to validation, to build your team and go to market. And at the end of this, we give you a lifetime of support. So whether it is getting that product market fit, whether it is getting funding, whether it is getting that Series A venture funding, that's what the Institute is here to do. And we provide a lifetime of support even after you graduate. What are the results? Over the last 10 years, 45 plus portfolio companies have been acquired. 
over 950 US million dollars has been raised from investors. And what do we do? We find great people, we give them a devoted support network, we put them through a structured growth process, and as mentioned, we provide a lifetime of support. Now, some of you are thinking, I want this, I want to sign up right now. Well, the good news is we have a program that is starting in a few weeks' time. So if you have thought about creating your dream company, now is your moment. But the word of warning, the Founder Institute is difficult. And the reason is it's difficult is that not all startups are successful. At the Founder Institute, less than 40% make it through the program. And that's by design. We want the best to graduate. We practice brutal honesty. There are no threes that are all had. We want to ensure that you learn quickly. We want you to complete your deliverables so that you are making progress and that you get high mental ratings. And if you're one of the 60% who don't make it through the program, you're always welcome back. And one of the friends in the Institute, Jason Calacanis has said, the Founder Institute is the most raw street program out there for startups. And given his really cool podcast, as well as his success as an angel investor, I think that's great credit. So if you'd like to take part, we do ask for founders to pay a small application fee, but it's free if you've attended today. So please follow the links that you'd receive by email. And if you have any questions about the upcoming program of the Institute, which we're very excited to be starting in a couple of weeks time, please quiz me. My name is Benjamin Chong, and together with my co-directors, I'm very excited to be presenting the program for you. So in summary, the Founder Institute provides a devoted support network and a structured growth process to help you get traction and funding. And in Australia and New Zealand, we know that founders don't have to go it alone. And therefore, our vision is for a regional ecosystem across Australia and New Zealand to challenge 1,000 plus founders to build enduring companies to solve the world's biggest problems. Someone just asked me a question, do successful companies have to be US domiciled eventually as part of the program? No. We're happy for you to be domiciled in Australia or in New Zealand for that. We are also in this region very keen on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and we encourage founders to build one or more of these Sustainable Development Goals into their business. Why? Because we care about the future and we also think it makes good business sense. So here are some photos of the directors in the region. Very pleased to be working with Phoebe, with Charlotte, with Paul, Cheryl, and with Chris. And if you've got any further questions, please use the Q&A feature that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, I turn to the man who is not only extremely, how shall I say, experienced in the world of marketing, he has dirt under his fingernails. Started working in marketing at Living Social, which was a group buying business over about 10 years ago. He's worked for OOH, out of home media. And more recently, he's been a growth marketing instructor at Academy XI. And more recently, he has been helping a whole range of businesses, including well-known startups, implement sales and marketing systems that bring in steady flows of leads. That's not only cost effective, but time effective. So I'm really pleased to welcome William Wang, who is going to be taking us through how we get to our first 100 customers. Over to you, William. 
Thanks, Benjamin. Cheers for that. Hope you guys can all see me okay and I'm coming through. Let me know in the comments if you can see me and hear me. I, uh, yep, looks like, hey, Benjamin, I've, I've got a quick question for you, man. This is, this is a bit of a funny one. Um, your, your hair, mate, is that COVID hair? <laughs> Did you grow it out during lockdowns? Or that's that's a on? very, very good question. I, <laughs> I, I, I oscillate. Sometimes I have short hair like you, and other times the hair has grown, and it has certainly grown because we are in lockdown here in Sydney. I have not had a chance to see my hairdresser for the last two months. Yeah. Brilliant, mate. I'm growing out the uh, top bun slash, uh, <laughs> what do you call it? Little thing at the back. So it's all good. <laughs> so anyway, glad you guys could hear me and see me before we start off with a bit of a laugh. Uh, I'm going to share my screen pretty shortly, but I don't know if I can see my comments or not, but everyone on here, please, please do comment and take part and be interactive. Um, you know, I love the energy that I get from, well, normally I do this stuff live, right, in person. So um, please comment and let me know I've got questions or that kind of stuff, but I'm going to jump straight into it and hit share screen. Hopefully sound is coming across to you all nicely. And let me hit present on here. So, uh, can you all see my screen? Let me know in the comments on here. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Let's get rolling. I've only got half an hour for this and I can talk about this kind of stuff for months. So I'm going to try and distill as much knowledge as I can uh, to give it to you in an actionable format over the next 30 minutes. Uh, obviously there's Q and A afterwards. So hey, feel free to jump in and leave your questions on here. And I'll try to get to as many as I can. Now, what I'm going to try and share with you tonight are some framework strategies and tactics to help, to help you go and get your first or next 100 customers. So, you know, 100 customers is a really good level of, you know, by the time you get 100 customers, you should really know your market, know your products. So I think it's a really good goal to look at. So I'm going to be sharing with you how I've seen a few businesses, uh, certainly ones that I've advised, you know, or work with, um, how we've been able to achieve this goal as quickly as possible. Now, I use it interchangeably, by the way, with a uh, million dollars in revenue or 100 customers, whichever one comes first to you, that's completely fine. Now, the way that I like to run these sessions is, you know, the old saying, give a person a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish and they'll be fine for a lifetime. I don't know if there's enough time to teach you how to fish properly, but I can get you started. I can give you the poll and then you can go out and start fishing. And, you know, the more you do this kind of stuff I'm going to share with you, the more you learn and the more you learn, the more you're going to earn later on. So I'm going to give you some strategies and templates and examples so you can go and execute this as quickly as possible. But I'm also going to give you the mental frameworks and thinking and processes and questions so you can keep growing and you know, getting more customers and business on board. So I hope that's okay with you all. Uh, again, today we're going to be covering frameworks. I'm going to give you real strategic thinking and tactics. Uh, I've got something pretty exciting to share with you all in terms of real numbers of a new launch in terms of a product. So I'm going to take you through some of the ads if you want to see it. I'm going to take you through some of the numbers behind it and also the thinking behind launching this new product. So that's what we're going to cover. Uh, I'm going to talk through some examples and templates. And again, if you have something more specific, at the end, I'm happy to dive in and share some more specific examples with you. Uh, before we get into all of that, though, just a quick two second summary of who I am. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of, of a company called Growth Labs. We're a bootstrap growth marketing consultancy and agency uh, built from the ground up, been around for about five years and you know, been able to uh, and also very lucky to have worked with some amazing businesses out there. Uh, some of the businesses that I'm going to share with you in terms of, you know, what we did with them. Um, one business was a health business, health-based online business that grew from zero to $1 million in revenue in 12 months, um, way more than hundred customers, but I'm going to peel back the curtains of that and talk a little bit about processes and also marketing that went on behind the scenes. Uh, and the most exciting bit is I've actually got a, a product that we've launched to market recently. So I'm going through this process again myself, and I'm going to take you through exactly what we're doing with that to get to a hundred. Uh, again, here's some of the companies that we've we've worked with in the past. You might recognize it, uh, you know, this one down to the bottom right hand side, Air Wallex, uh, an absolute unicorn story, amazing story coming out of the Australian startup scene. So I was lucky enough to uh, get involved in them pretty early on in terms of the sales and marketing uh, teams at the building. Um, 
when we started working together, consulting on the marketing and customer acquisition, I think they had two or three people in the marketing team um, you know, and sales team. And now the sales team is just going from strength to strength, 50 plus um, team members, and they're just doing such an amazing job. So it was really interesting to be able to help and observe the growth behind a company like that. And also some of the smaller companies that we advise and, and help to grow as well. Um, the real life example, the stuff that I'm going to go behind the scenes. And by the way, um, you know, if you're on this recording and you want to know more about it, feel free to ask me any questions about this business in particular. It's my business. I'm happy to share the numbers, the thinking, the ads, whatever it is that you want to see. Uh, it's a product called Freelancing Life, and it's an online educational group training product to help uh, nine to five people move into a freelancing kind of arrangement. So I'll explain more about that and use it as an actual example to show you some of the things that we've got here. Uh, cool. So with all that being said, I hope you're ready to jump in. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it and look at three key things you need to have or need to know to get your first 100 or your next 100 customers. So I'm going to show you some growth principles that we have to pay attention to. We're going to look at, you know, how do we make su success inevitable? Now, very early on, you're going to feel like, look, I don't know what direction we're going. Is this the right product? Is this the right market? I'm going to give you a process and a frame of thinking, I, I guess you call it, that's going to help you go back from where you want to end up and make sure that every step of the way you're making a success and hitting the goal of 100 customers or a million dollars in revenue, whatever it is, make that inevitable. I'm going to share that with you. And I'm going to go into each of the different levels of growth and uh, break it down into what you should be looking at at each level. And I'll explain that as we go. But this is where we start getting into the real tactical stuff and the real examples of what you can actually do. But if you don't have the first two things, right? If you don't have the right strategies, the right principles, if you don't have the right thinking behind making success inevitable, the tactics actually don't matter. So first and foremost, growth principles. Uh, one of the first places I always start, right? When I work with a client, especially in a very early stage is looking at why. Um, so that whole thing about, you know, I, I think Simon Sinek's got a YouTube video where it's got millions and millions of views where you start with the why, right? You start with the long-term vision. And I find that especially in the very early days, especially when you don't know exactly who your customer base are, what their objections are, what they're trying to achieve, having a why or what you're trying to change in the world or a big, scary, hairy or audacious goal that drives you forward, that's going to get you through so much of the stuff that's going to happen afterwards. So you start with the why. I start with looking at yourself, right? Looking at what are our strengths in this business? What are we trying to accomplish? What are our unique selling propositions or USPs? And what are some of the opportunities available to us in this market? Now, I'm not really a big fan of looking at the weaknesses. Sometimes I do, sometimes I look at competitors, but I tend to focus on, you know, what makes us so special? What are we trying to do? And how can we serve our customers the best? Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase um, that the UFC fighter, Conor McGregor, I'm sure some of you might've heard of him. He had a really, uh, really good phrase early on in his career where he said, winners focus on winning and losers focus on winners. So I've got the same mentality when it comes to growth. The only thing you should focus on is getting that one Thing, right? You're one customer and it's serving them in the best way possible. So coming to that, what I mean is let's start with you know, one target market, one problem we're trying to solve and one tactical strategy that we think is going to work best. And if you have one, 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 you've got super focus and that's how you fast track your way to success. Um, I've seen businesses with just these three ones lined up hit million dollars in revenue in, in such a short amount of time. And you don't need, you know, 10 different marketing strategies. You don't need growth hacks or anything like that. You just need to focus on the right ones. So I hope that makes making sense so far. Um, now, some of the things that I look at, right, from a growth perspective is you've got to talk to your market every single day, especially early on. Every single day, you have to have conversations booked in with your market to either learn from them or to teach them or to give them some kind of value. So that's a growth principle you have to abide by. Now, when you are speaking to them, you either win, which is a sale or a customer, that could be an option, or you learn. You learn more about the market today than you did yesterday. And you take this knowledge and you go and change your product, change your marketing, change how you talk about what you do until you're successful. Now, there's a wise man out there who said, if you know yourself and you know your opponent, do not fear the results of a thousand battles. Um, I've got Kanye West on here, but it's actually not Kanye West. Sorry, guys and girls. Uh, drop it into the comments if you know who actually said this. Throw it into the comments as I 
It's not Bruce Lee. Sun Tzu, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of those ancient Chinese dudes, Sun Tzu, I think it is. I was going to say Confucius. I don't have the same person. Um, anyway, my, my history is shocking. So <laughs> it's one of those dudes. Uh, anyway, let's look at uh, strategies versus tactics, right? So we know what some of the principles of growth are. Let's look at, is it strategies or is it tactics? What I mean by that, and this is... Um, a great infographic to show what the difference is. Strategies is a high level plan of attack, right? We know what the goal is. We know what we're trying to do. What's the high level plan to get us to that goal? And then the tactics are the specific actions you're going to take to help you execute this strategy. So for example, with freelancing life, I've got a goal um, and I've got a, a strategic way of looking at it where we're going to generate a million dollars in revenue in six months through effective growth marketing. My strategy is effective growth marketing. My goal is a million dollars in six months. And my tactics off the back of that are Facebook ads, content marketing, and partnerships. Tactics can change at a drop of a hat. Your strategy should be consistent, right? So that's how I'm thinking about this in terms of growth. Now, a few other things to note, growth takes time, right? It, it, it really takes a lot of time and testing and learning before you can really hit your strides. And during that time, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. And that's completely cool because if you don't make the mistakes, you're not gonna learn, you're not gonna grow. Uh, but when you do make mistakes, it's really important to only make them once. And that's the key to learning, right? First you learn and then you earn is another saying. I use a lot of sayings that I, I hear from time to time. I don't always attribute to the right person. This came from someone way smarter and wiser than me. Uh, so the fitness business I was talking about where we did zero to million in revenue in 12 months, what it actually looked like behind the scenes was the first month to four months, everything was actually negative. So the partners of the business, there were three partners. I was an early stage advisor slash investor. We all put money into this business from our day jobs, right? The four of us were working away, collecting our paychecks, taking a portion of the paychecks and putting it into the business and just learning how to do this growth thing, this marketing thing. So the first one to four months was uh, you know, completely negative. We were all throwing money into ads. And then on month four and month six, something started to tick, right? We had enough learnings about the market. We had enough customer or lead interviews. We had enough um, data and insights about the market where we started to really see some better results from the ads. So months four to six, we had a slight profit. And six to 12, that a million dollars in revenue that was pretty much generated in the last half of that 12 month period. So it just goes to show you, um, you know, what, what you can do if you take the right time to go through with this. Now, we're also going to look at, um, you know, how do you make your success inevitable? So that was the first bit, right? Looking at what our growth strategies are, what our growth principles are. Well, the next question is, well, okay, that's all well and good, right? That's an okay way of thinking, but how do we then go and make sure that we are successful with all of this here? So uh, let me know in the comments. There's a few questions in the comments, which I'll get to towards the end. Just remember them for me. Um, but let me know if you, um, if you know who this person is here. Let me know in the comments if you, even if you don't know, let me know if you don't know who this person is. <laughs> it does kind of look like Greg Norman. <laughs> I'll come back to this business. It's someone in the US. Paul Hogan, getting pretty close. It's someone actually from the US. So this person here, uh, his name is Bill Walsh. And Bill is an American football coach. Well, he was an American football coach, right? Um, Bill's story, and I'll summarize this in a really, really quick way. But Bill's story was that uh, he took over uh, the San Francisco 49ers, which was an, uh, which is a team in the NFL. And when he took over that team as a coach, they were, I think, the worst team in the NFL at that time. Like, just a horrible team, so I've heard. But over two seasons, with Bill's um, training and coaching and helping them, they actually turned things around to the point where they actually won the Super Bowl multiple, multiple times. So the reason why I've got Bill on here is because he had such an interesting philosophy of uh, you know, coaching and helping his, his team achieve greatness. And his philosophy was that the scorecard or the score takes care of itself. Now, this is badly paraphrased, right? But essentially what that means is focusing on the little things that you can control and doing those things right and letting the scorecard worry about itself. Because if we do every little piece leading up to the sale, leading up to the customer acquisition correctly, we don't have to worry about what's going to happen on the sales call, on the sales page. If, we, if you do every single bit right leading up to it, 
everything else will take care of itself, right? There's no way that you're not going to succeed. So that kind of answers the question of you know, how does this apply to growth and finding the 100. So the way that I look at applying this is finding the actions that we need to take daily, weekly, or monthly to go and hit your goals, right? What do we have to do every single day, every single week, every single month to make sure that we have to come through and hit our goals? Uh, and also we're going to focus on the actions and let the scorecard worry about itself. Now, I'm going to take an example here, right? And this is from Freelancing Life, the product that I was talking about. And uh, again, after this, if you want if you have any questions about how I break this down and think about this kind of stuff, please feel free to throw it into the question box at the moment uh, and I'll come back and, and talk through all of it. But essentially, you know, as a really easy example, if I wanted to generate a million dollars in revenue in six months, what that boils down to is 285 customers if I'm charging three and a half thousand dollars for the product, right? Uh, 285 customers across 12 or six months means I've got to divide it by six, which means 23 customers uh, a year. So 23 customers a year equals um, a year, a month. 23 customers a month is six customers a week. Now, let's just say, let's just take an example out of the air. And this is a number that I kind of use with clients if they don't track the data, they don't really know. But let's just say I get onto 10 calls and my win rate on 10 calls is two clients or 20% conversion rate. That means I need to get 30 conversations a week to hit this goal. Does that make sense so far? Let me know in the comments. Um, the last one, Paul, uh, Freelancing Life. I'm, I'm going to actually talk to you, uh, talk about all of this, but Freelancing Life is a brand new thing. It's literally been um, you know, two weeks. We don't even have a website, but I'm going to take you through all the process around this. Perfect. All makes sense. Great. So then the question isn't, well, how do I make a million dollars in six months? Because that's a really big question. And sometimes you know, when you look at growth, you're going to freak yourself out and go, I don't know how to do it. But this is hopeless. But now the question is, well, it's not about million dollars in six months. That'll take care of itself. How do I get my 30 conversations a week, right? That's how we break it down to make sure that we're going to be successful. So I then break it down even further and I say 30 conversations a week equals six conversations a day. So how many conversations do I need to have uh, or how many conversations do I have tomorrow? And is there a gap in there, right? So I distill our big goals into a daily action and all I'm going to, you know, KPI myself and my team against is this daily action here. Like, what are my goals tomorrow? How many calls have I got? What's my gap? You know, what gap do I have to fill? And what is my daily activity to generate the six conversations a day, right? And what can I do weekly to boost these numbers so I don't have to stress about this day-to-day -day or I've got my calendar booked out for a week? And what are the big moves or highly leveraged actions I can take every single month to make my weekly and my daily easier? So that's how I break it down to focus on exactly what we need to do and get the small things right and let the scorecard take care of itself. Now, again, using a real example for this business, because of the market, the way I think about it, you know, it made sense to go through with Facebook ads. Um, a lot of the, that decision was based on results we're seeing for our clients, what my team are capable of, uh, you know, how we're going to scale. But essentially, I looked at this product in this market and said, look, let's test the market. Let's see if we can do something with it, right? So... Um, as you can see, based on the Facebook stuff we've done, I've got uh, a whole lot of information on here. Um, and again, Vinny, in terms of the uh, buy, buy persona, I'll come back to this. Uh, don't worry, I'll cover this. But in terms of, you know, no, if you know what your market is, if you know how you're going to tackle it, if you know what tests that you're going to have, it's really easy to then go through and look at the metric that matters, right? Uh, so, for example, as you can see on here, last week, we spent about $700 on ads. Our click-through was okay. Our cost per click was a bit high. All of this stuff doesn't really matter, right? We got two sales um, at $2,500 a sale, which is a cheaper, bit, better pricing, which means uh, we have $5,000 in revenue for $600 or $700 in ad spend, giving me a return on investment of seven times. But here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. I've bolded out these two dot points on here, the number of appointments we have and also the cost per call because this is the daily actions that matter to me, right? If these numbers hold, I don't care what my return on investment is because I know it's going to be good as long as I'm improving every single day, right? I, I don't care how much I'm paying cost per click because my most important metric, my number of phone calls, my cost per phone call is treating the right way. If I can take care of this, everything else falls into place. Does that make sense? Let me know in the comments if this makes sense. Vinny, you're jumping the gun a little bit. I'll come back to this. Yep, perfect. 
Okay, great. Mash check out, awesome, perfect. Uh, so exactly reverse engineer the whole process of success, right? So one of the things you wanna do uh, is look at your process, right? What is your sales process? What is your process for getting leads into the door? Um, what is your process for getting feedback from your customers? And what is the process itself of turning a lead into a conversation, a conversation into a sale? Like what do you need to do first, second, and third? And which piece of the puzzle can you control? So looking back at my example, I can't control, the only thing I can control is how much we're spending on ads on here and how good our ads are doing, right? I can test my way to this. There's not a lot I can control further down the process, but at the very beginning, I, there's more that I can control. So my thinking is, look, at the moment, it's a brand new product, new to market, don't even have a website. I need to have as many conversations as I can to understand my market. And the only way I can have those conversations is if I'm going through and using more ads, right? So it's all about learning. So look at the piece of the puzzle you can control and keep focusing on that. Now, here's where we get into the tactical bits, right? So actually at this point in time, I wanted to take you know, one key takeaway. So if you had a takeaway yet, if you had an insight yet, drop it into here. Um, so we'll look at this in just a second. Vinny, we're gonna have an interesting conversation, man. I'm gonna get you on here and uh, this is gonna be good. So tact do something every day, tactics. Um, uh, do something every day. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. One, one, one. Perfect. Great. I'm going to keep going into the tactical bit, right? Because that's all thinking bit. And if you skip the thinking bit and you skip too far ahead, the tactics don't really matter, right? It really doesn't matter. Now, here's where we look at what can we do to make sure we're growing every single day and we're going to hit our growth targets and our growth goals. So by the way, there's no one size fits all and, and your tactics will actually change as you go ahead, right? As you hit different levels of business, your tactics will actually change, right? So that all being said, I'm gonna give you some rough guidelines and these are really rough. It's gonna be different depending on where you're coming from your business uh, and there's different things that you can do. And some of the tactics actually carry over across different levels and different areas. But um, just bear in mind that, you know, you've got to decide for yourself when you're gonna change tactics and which makes sense to you. Now, at zero to 20, here's where we go for and learn everything we can about our market, right? If you don't understand your market, if you don't know what the biggest bleeding neck problems are, and when I say bleeding neck problems, it's the problems that they have to solve, right? It's um, the, a really good analogy of that is looking at a painkiller versus a vitamin. Like if you sell vitamins, yeah, it's all well and good. You know, it's about improving the life um, that someone has and people are going to buy that. But if you sell a painkiller, it's a much more urgent need, right? They're going through pain. They want to get out of pain. It's a big motivator. So zero to 20 customers is where you go through and learn as much about your market as you can, literally everything. And this is where the idea of having as many conversations or having one conversation a day really comes into play. Now, at this level, you're going to do everything that you can, even if it isn't scalable. And the best example of that is when Airbnb first started, the founders, I think they used to fly around and take the photos of the, the members' houses themselves, right? Just to understand, just to talk to more of the members, just to talk to more of their customers. So at this stage, all I'm focusing on is I think I've got a hypothesis. I think what we do is going to be really helpful for a target market, our target audience. What I need to do is validate this idea, right? As part of the validation, maybe we're going to get some customers. And if not, that's completely fine. So I'm going to pivot and learn. And I'm going to put a new offer in front of my customers. So at this level, there's a few things that we can look at you know, tactically. Now, number one that you can do on here is go through to your network. Now, when I started my business here, the fitness business, when that got started, uh, the main person behind the business, Drew, was a personal trainer. So he went to his network, this new business of mine, I'm going to my network again, go to your network first and, and just say to them, look, I'm launching or thinking about doing this or solving this problem. Do you know anyone who might find it useful, Right. All we're doing at the moment is we're going to have as many conversations as we can, 100 conversations, 200 conversations, whatever that number is, what can you do on your part at the moment to go and have these conversations? And you know, if you're, if you're tapped at your network, the next thing you can look at doing is looking at direct outreach, right? Just reaching out to people who you think you can help, who you think you can solve a problem for, and talking to them and presenting the solution in front of them. So this is where we go for and say, look, I'm thinking about doing this. 
do you have, first of all, the problem I'm trying to solve? Because if they don't, you might be solving, you know, a non-bleeding neck problem, a bottom of the totem pole problem, and it might make it a little bit harder to market. So that's the number one thing I look at, right? How many conversations can I have to establish that, yes, there is a real need for what we do? And then have, the more conversations you have, the more you get to understand, well, have you thought about doing it this way? Have you looked at testing this to solve your problem, right? What have you done so far to try and solve this problem yourself? And then you're going to come up with a way of looking at your product, looking at your offer and say, look, if I can solve this for you based on your feedback. So Tom or Mary, thank you so much for talking to me. Give me your ideas based on your, based on your feedback, based on your ideas. I think I can help you solve this problem and help you move through a better situation by doing this. And here's how I want to help you, right? A no brainer offer for them just to get your first zero to 10, zero to 20 customers on board, right? You're validating, you're learning, and you're also trying to you know, prove the idea that someone's going to give you money for this. It's really, really important at this stage to take money for it because people can say, yes, you can have you know, a million people on an email list, but unless you can validate by taking payment, uh, it's not quite as strong. So zero to 20, you're learning, you're validating, you're getting your first sales on board. Does that make sense so far? Let me know in the comments. Perfect. Awesome. So 21 to 50, right? This At this stage, I'm hoping, it, would, it obviously depends if you're B2B, B2C, uh, how many customers you know, you've got, the value. It really depends on have you validated what you're trying to do. Um, you should have really had about 100 to 200 conversations at this point. Again, going to whoever you can. When I was validating some of my ideas, I walked into businesses or I went through to businesses where I was already giving them money, right? My, my gym, I went through to my dry cleaners. I went through to, you know, whoever it is that is close to you in your network just to have those conversations. Now, 21 to 50, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because you should have somewhat of a proven offer. You've got people who have paid you money, right? As in real customers to validate that your solution is what they're looking for. And you've got an inkling that, hey, I think this could scale. Now, at this level, you're probably looking to get outside of your immediate network. So there's more tactics that you can look at uh, at this stage to grow and get you know, from 21 to 50. So some of the things that you can look at is you know, taking what really, really worked previously and just scaling it. So if you had 100 interviews, go and do 200 or 300 and keep learning about the market. Uh, one of my most successful clients in terms of you know, how fast they've grown and what they do, um, when, when they started, right, they, um, they just blitzed the market. They, they ran 52 events every single year, like an event every single week. They traveled all across Australia doing events, driving people through these events with the view of giving value, but also learning about you know, what their market is struggling with. And so from doing that, they got so much good information that they really blitzed through this bit. Um, and then, but at the end of it, they looked at it and said, look, we've done 10 events. We've spoken to about 500 people. 300 to 500 people we know what's working but we keep getting sales from these events so let's just pick the thing that's worked and double down and scale it right so they had one strategy which is working and they just really scale that one uh, you can also look at you know what can we do to grow into the future so we can look at do we hire someone to run the hard work if you did outreach in this first step right if you outreach by email phone social media whatever it was can I hire someone to double my output, right? To help me do this even more. Um, you know, can I do something to automate the process of acquiring customer from what worked previously? Now, at this stage, I would really look at bringing some kind of referral play into process here, right? So um, going to your cu current customers, the ones that you've got, the 20 or the 50, and saying, hey, who do you know that, might, that I might be able to help as well? Because chances are, if you help one person solve a particular problem, their network, right? Or they're surrounded by five similar looking people, right? The saying that goes, uh, we're, we're the product of our five immediate network, you know, five people, five people closest to us, uh, that cliche saying. It's kind of true though. If you solve a problem for one person, chances are they know a few other people in the same position as them because they're talking to other people about this and they're looking for solutions around that. If it makes sense. Um, and at this stage, now that we've got the validation, now is when we start thinking, okay, cool. Let's start putting together some content, maybe some social proof, right? Some client testimonials. If you've got 20 to 50 customers, it's pretty easy to turn around to a few of them and say, hey, 
you know, I'd love to get your feedback. And when they do give you the feedback, say, amazing. First of all, do you know anyone else I can refer this to? Um, and then secondly, um, you know, by the way, can I use your feedback as a testimony on my website? Because I absolutely love what you have to say, right? Really, really easy, gentle way to do both the referral and also the testimonial as well. Um, again, at this stage, um, if you're B2B especially, outreach should still definitely be a big part of this mix. Uh, I'm a big believer in outreach because it means you're going directly to the market that you want to be speaking to, directly to your best leads and having conversations. Again, for B2C, it's, you know, it might not be the right strategy, for, but for B2B, definitely would be. Uh, you should start planning on your inbound strategies, right? Only if you have extra capacity. So, you know, I would start looking at, well, who are our best customers, right? We've got 20 customers. Who are our best customers, right? what do we actually help them with? Like, is this still the same uh, solution in my mind as it is when we had zero or 10 customers? Is this still the same solution? And where do they hang around online, right? There should be some kind of trend in here that I can see from my best customers that I can take and go through and leverage this and get in front of more of people just like them. Again, we're going to come back and say, look, and then how do we look at or ask for and incentivize referrals? Do we put a 10% share on it? Do we give them a coupon for the next sale? What do we do and how do we encourage referrals at this stage? So you can do things like putting um, a simple line in email saying, we work a lot for referrals. We love referrals. Um, if you like what we do, please refer us. You can put a whole page in the website talking about your referral program or your affiliate program, whatever it is. This should be where you start looking at this year. Now, you can also go through and start creating you know, more content. So um, eBooks, uh, you know, webinars, things that's really going to help you establish yourself even further and marketing assets you can leverage down the pipe. And again, it's all coming back to, you know, let's start looking at building the pipeline because we have a decent flow of leads coming through. Let's build a pipeline to get in front of more of them, right? Now at 50 to 100, it gets, it gets really, really interesting. Um, so you know, this is where we look at, well, what has really scaled? So at this point, do we hire a sales team, right? If direct outreach is working in a B2B sense, do we then go through and just scale this massively and grow and get more people on our sales team, right? You should have a really defined map of who your customers are by this point, by the way. So you should know what their, their struggles are. So we can really easily go and create um, information or content that tackles some of the struggles they're going through, right? You should, you should know what's worked best and just double and triple down on that. Now, at this point in, in stage, you should have some revenue flowing through as well. And I've only included the advertising on this side because for some businesses, it's so much better to validate without having to do the advertising than it is to go straight into ads. Now, freelancing life, I showed you an example of us going into the ad market and just validating. Uh, it's a bit of a different scenario and context with that. Now, if I was starting from scratch, I wouldn't do the ads. But the fact is, you know, I've got this business on the uh, growth labs does pretty well as a business. We've got cash that we have to in invest. Um, you know, otherwise the tax man comes after me and I've got a great team who can run the ads. So for me, that's, uh, you know, the best leverage platform or way that we can go and validate and grow our customer base, right? But for you, if you're just starting out, just have those conversations and figure out what you need to, you know, what you need to do to get those initial conversations, maybe without even running ads. But again, coming back to the 50 to 100 level, this is probably where we start looking at advertising, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn, Google, it's a different use case for each of the platforms. Facebook is more uh, disruption marketing. So jumping into someone's feed as they're scrolling pictures of cats or babies, uh, it's a very different approach to a professional network, for example, say LinkedIn. And it's also, again, a very different approach to uh, a, an advertising platform like Google, where people are actively searching for what you do. But at this stage, it really is about setting up pipeline and bringing in leads with the expectation of nurturing them until they turn into a customer. So uh, a quick summary of all of this before I jump into the questions and really go deep into anything that you guys want to discuss, um, you know, focus on the growth principles first and foremost, right? Conversations, understanding, knowing where you are in the process. Are you zero to 20 where you have to figure out your market? Are you 21 to 50? Are you 51 to 100 or are you 100 plus? Different scenarios and tactics in each one. Um, reverse engineer it though, and make customer acquisition and success inevitable, right? Uh, depending on what stage you're at and pick the one tactic at each stage and focus on it, right? Follow one course until successful. Focus on the one audience you wanna serve, test your solution for the audience, have one tactic to go into the market and generate those conversations with that audience and you know, validate your ideas and get the sales. 
Now, coming back to that, you know, ideas I wanted to leave you with is test, test, and test again. Um, you know, every conversation you have is a learning opportunity. It's not, you know, I, I value, especially initially, the learning piece so much more than the sales piece. I want to know what my market is thinking about, right? What they what, what they're doing, what they're saying, how they're buying, who's actually buying. Am I, am I talking the right language to them? It, it's so important to have that understanding before you even think about scaling and getting to 100. I'm literally focused on who is my next customer and what are they telling me in the process? Um, so you know, don't dismiss talking to customers and don't stop it too early. Now focus on the actions and the results should take care of themselves, right? If you adapt and adjust accordingly to what you learn. So... Uh, I'm going to stop the slides on here because I know that there's a stack of really, really great questions. There's going to be some really good discussions as well. We go deep into a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share. Here's my email, guys, if you want some extra help. We've got some other questions afterwards. But let me stop this screen share. And uh, Benjamin, um, I can see that you're back online. So I am here. I've been listening and I have been savouring your words. And you've got a fantastic setup there with the high fidelity microphone and the, the headphones so fantastic we've got a couple of questions here so if you have a question for our marketing czar today please put it in the q a the q a feature that's going to be better because it allows us to manage some of the questions so let's start off with an easy one how did you help the children's hospital with their sales it was a, a consulting piece in terms of looking at fundraising uh, so looking at how do we get more people onto a fundraising dinner? Uh, and so the idea was centered around a B2B campaign where we reached out to business owners and uh, you know elite business people from within the area and um, with a personalized invitation to the fundraiser. So uh, it was more of a consulting piece. Great, thank you. Now, we've got a question here from Geordie who's working on an app. In your experience, what have you seen works when getting app users on board? That's a good question. I need some more context in terms of... Um, okay, maybe if Geordie can provide, is, is it a business-to-business -business type app? Is it a consumer app? Perhaps, Geordie, if you can provide a little bit more, more information there, that would be fantastic. Let's see what else we have here. My customer base for the next five years, this is Prashant, is a total of 8,000. In the first year... I wish to acquire 200 customers only. How do we, I think Prashant, you need to provide a bit more detail here. It's not, it's not really clear. We, a bit of, bit of context is important for us to be able to help target this. I've got a product development question for you. What if you don't have a product to sell yet? What happens if you're in the process of what we might call customer development? So many people in my experience think that if they build it, they will come and, and, and that they will come as the customers. Whereas what I'd suggest that the lean startup methodology teaches is that the more you understand the customers, the better you're able to craft a product that is able to best suit their needs. Do you have some tips on how to craft when you don't have a product yet? That's a really good question. And, you know, um, I know there's a few questions around the freelancing life thing, which I mentioned. That's the best example of that because I went into the market, right, thinking that, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I can help someone leave the corporate job and start freelancing? This whole idea came about when I was surfing with a friend. Um, I've been giving him hints and tips over the past year or so, and he finally left his job recently. So we were surfing and he was just saying, hey, this is the coolest thing. I love being in control of my own time. And then I just, someone clicked and I said, look, I want to test this market. I, I don't have the product built. There's no website. All I, all I want to know is, is this a big enough um, pain point for all other people out there where they actually want to take some action and take some progress and, you know, get the result from this. So all my metric is, again, I don't have the product built yet, right? I'm building it with the people that come through. But all I want to do is how many conversations can I have? And so I'm going through and literally, you know, having 50 to 100 conversations, listening to what people are telling back to me, looking at the trends in terms of what do these people, you know, what are they saying when I have a, have a chat to them? Who's a really good, you know, who can I help to solve? And who's a qualified um, lead, let's just say, that could potentially come through and work with us in future. Now, 
from those conversations and I've had about 20 of them so far, I've had two people where I went back to them and said, look, based on what you're saying, you're in a really high paying job. You're, you know, you're, you've got expertise. It's not going to be that hard to find clients because recruiters are knocking at your door. So if I can show you how to package everything else up and if I can help you make this amount of money and charge you, you know, less than 2% of what you'd be making as a, as a freelancer, if you took all these opportunities up, would that be something you're willing to pay for? And they've said, yes, absolutely. Especially if it's such a low amount versus how much I can be making. And so my next question was, cool, I've got Stripe open. Can I charge you for it? And let's go, you know, help me build this with you. And so the answer was, yes, awesome. Let's do it. Mm, So that they're going to build a product with me and every step of the way, they're going to help me make it better for the next generation coming through. Mm, Okay, that's helpful. We've got an interesting question here, William, from Sal. In an enterprise environment where there's a a MVP and they want for the the customer, presumably, wants the MVP to be fully functional, you've got this chicken and egg scenario where quite often you you need to get your customers on board who provide you with the the data in which you want to run your, your, your MVP over. Do you have a suggestion on how to approach getting the first one to five enterprises on board? Because it, 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 there's always this, this difficulty sometimes with, uh, with these enterprises. They're, they're conservative by nature and, and for good reason. That's a, I think there's two sides to this question. So the first side is why are you going after enterprises first and foremost? before enterprises by nature are actually very risk averse, right? And you, if you think about the buying process, we work with a lot of enterprise clients. If you think about the, the buying process, the person who says yes to us and who approves our invoice, if things go horribly, they can lose their job. They can lose their job for saying yes, right? It's very hard for them to lose their job to say no. They can easily say no, keep it status quo, and keep things rolling, right? So by nature, the people working for these enterprises are gonna be more risk averse. Whereas if you're talking to a business owner or an entrepreneur, they know that there's an upside to this, not just a downside. And it, you know, then it's your job to, to match up the upside with the downside. So that'll be the first question I've got, like why are you specifically targeting only enterprises? Why don't you go prove the concept and you know, get to the point where you can turn around and the enterprises are actually willing to talk to you because of who you got on board. Um, it's a concept that I use to, to grow my marketing consultancy where, you know, we started on, on, on smaller in the town, right? I, I started my father-in-law's business. Then we went and, and talked to his friends and his friends. And then we started to go outside of our network and get more customers on board and started to build up the reputation within those markets that, hey, we know what we're talking about. And then you start stacking on different customers higher up in the marketplace to the point where now we've got, you know, clients on the ASX, we've got clients on the New York Stock Exchange. But it took us a while to build up to the point where we can go after those customers. So the answer may be that you don't go after them right now. You validate the product that other people might have and you take that approach to to client stacking to get your way there. That's a very, very helpful perspective. On that same track, are there things that you've advised clients or you've seen done before when selling to organisations to reduce the sales cycle? Because quite often there'll be, oh, I'll introduce you to somebody, to procurement, I need to show you to the finance people, and then there's going to be an IT steering committee in three months' time, kill me now. Is there things that you've seen to, to shorten that, that, that cycle? Thanks, Craig, for that well, question. I'm- yeah, that's a great question, Craig. I'm going to drop a few ideas on here. None of these work in isolation. Please, you know, go through and, and test this for yourself. But the things that work for me is one, understanding who's part of the buying process. So for example, if I know that there's three decision makers, one of the things that I've done before is reached out to all three and set up separate meetings so we can all three of us, all three of them rather, are on the same track, right? If I've um, got a conversation with one of them, I can name drop that first person to get the call of the second person and name drop the first two people to get the call of the third person. Now I've spoken to them all individually and got all three on side, it's a much easier conversation. Whereas if you rock up to a conversation with three people, you've only spoken to one, other two are thinking, who, who is this person here? Why should I listen? What's in it for me, right? So that's one thing that you can do. Um, the other side of it too is understanding their buying process. So for example, you know, we're doing, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm helping out at a university in terms of 
um, you know, doing lectures and helping to, to coach some of their uh, startups through in terms of uh, program. And one of the buying processes that, that I had to go through was, hey, there's only a certain amount of budget that they can allocate without having to go through this months long process of, of, of procurement. So my thing was, well, let's start small. Let's push the trial through and get, you know, th these guys across the board as a customer first. Then what we can do is when, once we're a customer, it's easy to start getting more and billing more if you're providing more value, but then yeah, get your foot in the door and then worry build about the, the relationship, side. start small, sell a biscuit and then a coffee and then perhaps lunch. Yes. Exactly. I, I like that. Exactly. And, and your first point, your first point brought up a memory for me, and this was a couple of years ago. In my day job, I'm a venture capitalist. And I remember a few years ago, there was this company that was raising money and it contacted all of the people within the firm within a very short period with positive information. And they had really, really good results. So obviously, if you're a crap business, this tends not to work so well. But there was this buzz in the office and I said to my colleagues, have you been hit up by so-and-so? Have you? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've all been hit up by so-and-so. And the numbers seem really good. Maybe we should meet with these people. So it was like that. And, and, and I, I think it, it can also be the case of getting multiple introductions to the same organisation. There, there, there can be this, this creation of social proof where people go, ha. Oh, Wow, I was referred by Bill, by Jill, by by Jane. These guys must be the real McCoy. And also, there's you know that's such a good point, and uh, it just sparked a thought that I had. And you know, don't give up too early because so many people I see give up on you know don't chase. They think they're going to be annoying, but that's not the people are busy, right? People aren't thinking about you day in day out. They're thinking about themselves, and that's not a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's just human nature. Sure. Um, so I, I had a client who, you know, they had a proposal out there, the lead went cold on him. He kept following up every single week, twice a week for six months and couldn't get on the phone with them. Couldn't get an email back all of a sudden one day on a single follow-up, didn't get the call, didn't get an email, but had a proposal signed and deposited, you know, funds into his bank account. <laughs> six months, no return or email, anything like that. They were still keen, but they just weren't replying and six months into it. Hey, good. One of the biggest deals of his life. And, and in some you know, ways, just, that, that is a testament, isn't it? It's a testament to show that that person was very, very disciplined in following up. And if you're so disciplined in following me up and not being annoying, because obviously if I'm, I'm pissed off, I will say stop. Wow, you, you, you must have something going for you. Got a question here from Chris Darwin, and this might be one of the last two questions. If you know the customer's problem but do not know the best solution, how do you discover it? For example, we have an app to help people reduce their meat consumption. Yes, I should probably eat less meat. We know social pressure is the biggest barrier, but we do not know how to solve this problem. How might you approach this? Chris, love your work. Uh, Chris and I have actually had a couple of chats. So love your work, Chris. Love what you do. Um, I would, again, I'm going to come with a multi point approach. I would say, how do you know that's, you know, that is the single biggest thing to overcome because um, there's users who have already got your app and that's what they may, might be telling you, but have you interviewed anyone who was thinking about it? And can you find someone who's been thinking about it and, you know, get information from them? So maybe you could do something like set up conversations with a hundred people where you're going to talk them through the app, right? Talk them through what you're trying to achieve and watch them and sort the app on the phone. And if they hesitate or if they're not sure about it, go, hey, that's completely cool. Awesome. Thank you. Can you tell me why, you know, you're not going to install this app? Like what's stopping you? And that'll give you a real reason. And afterwards, you can always sit down with them and go, look, what can we do from our side to help you overcome this hesitancy? I always like to get, you know, actions to back up the words. And I always like to go to the market to, to, to see the action, right? To get the real, real McCoy from them. Right. Well, I think we're coming up to seven o'clock and I want to be true to time. William, you are a superstar, as usual. You've presented extremely well for us. We're very grateful for your time today. And what I wanted to share with everyone here is there's going to be an opportunity, if you'd like to participate in virtual networking, to stay on. And we are moving to a platform called AirMeet. So Paul Krasiewski, one of my 
fellow co-directors has just posted the link here for air meat and on this site make sure you get a note of it do a cut and paste on air meat you'll be able to look at this you'll be able to enter click enter and you'll be able to go to one of these tables and mingle with one another so I'm certainly going to be going over to Airmeet. I think a few others will. I'm not sure whether you've got time to join us, Will. You're very welcome if you can. But I would like everyone, if they're able, to, to give us a thumbs up in the Q&A or the chat for William. Thank you very much for being a part of today. I hope you've been able to take a couple of actionable insights around how you can build to your first 100 customers and beyond. And if you're interested in learning more about the Founder Institute and our upcoming program where we help turn founders into those who are building meaningful and enduring technology companies, please hit me up. HMU, I think that's what it's short for. So have a good one. See you very soon. And I'll catch you on 